Well, thank you, uh, David Hood, for uh, inviting me. It's a pleasure to, to be at this meeting, actually. It's my first time in Toronto, at least from a distance, so to say. Um, so I hope you can actually see my screen and my pointer. We can. Great. So uh, I'll present today a little on uh, muscle lipid droplets and mitochondria. And the majority of the work that I'll be showing is focused on microscopy. And um, we have three uh, ladies doing this kind of work. It's uh, uh, Anna Gemmink and uh, Sabine Damen and Nienke van Polanen. So they were the ones that did the majority of the microscopy that is underlying the data that I'll be showing. So today we'll focus on muscle lipid droplets and mitochondria. Um, for that, we usually focus on human, uh, human muscle biopsies that we can take. And we can use, say, conventional O to stain the lipid droplets. We can use transmission electron microscopy um, to uh, image the lipid droplets. And we nowadays also use more like the advanced the three dimensional confocal um, microscopy that we can quantitate uh, nicely. And sometimes we take advantage of the super resolution microscopy, of which this is a, a low resolution image, I must say but we can take advantage of the uh, high-res images there as well. So with these tools, um, I hope to guide you through a couple of uh, nice images, which obviously also do contain a message. So this is uh, just to show off a little what we can do from human muscle biopsies. In white, we see the muscle cell membrane. In blue, we see lipid droplets here. And with immunofluorescence, we can particularly stain uh, some of the proteins that are decorating these droplets. And then if you do that three dimensions, you can tilt the thing and have a nice view on capillaries and where these um, lipid droplets are located in the cell, for example. Well, some background information that is relevant to the talk. Uh, you're probably all aware that, uh, of the fact that, that compromised mitochondrial function and content, uh, along with excess lipids, uh, usually coincide with poor metabolic health. The reverse is not necessarily true. Uh, you can have a very good mitochondrial function and also a very high lipid content and being metabolically very healthy. That, for example, uh, applies for, for trained athletes. Um, we also know, and you probably know that as well, that the vast majority of lipid oxidation in humans occurs in mitochondria. These mitochondria and these lipid droplets are dispersed throughout muscle cells. And this is not particularly a random dispersion. It is um, a very well-organized dispersion, at least in healthy muscle cells. And we are also interested in the fact that we do observe that um, these muscle mitochondria, they are interconnected. They are um, organized into a, a network uh, that seems to be dynamic. And that also the lipid droplets interact within this mitochondrial network. And today I'll guide you through one and, and almost two studies where we were focusing on, on lipid droplets and mitochondria and their interaction. So in this particular study, uh, we're focusing on mitochondrial metabolism that we know is under control of uh, clock machinery. And this um, clock machinery that actually regulates the timing of the, um, the muscle cells, uh, for example, throughout the day. So this is, there's a, 24 hour rhythm in many of the processes that, uh, that we um, do know. And there seems to be a link between um, the clock in these muscle cells and actually metabolism that is going on. So from work that we did together with the group from Hélène Duess and uh, Bart Stahls and Lille, we learned that one of these clock genes known as reverb alpha has a profound effect on skeletal muscle oxidative capacity. So this is one of the few animal studies um, that, we, that we did, and we did that in cooperation. Uh, and in this particular case, the gene that is encoding for reverb alpha and R1D1 has been knocked out, and that indeed results in hampered um, physical performance. So what you can see here is that, that um, upon, where's my mouse? Yes, it's here. So that um, uh, upon um, knockdown of the, oh, it's not moving. I want to have my pointer. You don't see my pointer, do you? Well, the mouse in the mouse is We can so, see. So, um, we can see the slide. Yeah. Okay. Good. And the pointer now as well, I think. 
Uh, either way, uh, if you knock down the gene, you see there's a drop in exercise performance. So the, uh, the mice run less and they have a lower V2 max. They are more readily exhausted. Uh, and if you display it like this, there's a profound effect of the knockdown of the uh, gene that encodes for river alpha. If you do the opposite experiment, you overexpress or you stimulate reverb alpha, you do see that there is an increase, a massive increase in mitochondrial respiratory capacity that also does translate in improved running time and running distance. So this sort of links uh, the molecular clock to um, mitochondrial or muscle cell performance. So throughout the 24 hour day, um, the clock not only determines metabolic rhythmicity, but it also, for example, has certain times in the day when, when things peak. So um, this is the time in the day where you are actually, you are at a peak in alertness, which is nice, of course. You have elevated testosterone levels, which can help you to have um, muscle hypertrophy, but this is where I am. I already have a high cardiovascular and a strong skeletal muscle just because it's three o'clock in the afternoon here. But that is just a joke, of course. Um, but this central clock is uh, located in the brain and is predominantly regulated by input of light. So sunlight can really set the clock. But we also know that next to the brain, there are molecular clocks in almost every single peripheral uh, cell type. And these clocks, they are regulated or set or reset by nutrition and exercise. So we really think that um, peripheral clocks can be regulated by diet, can be regulated by exercise. And it's therefore only also likely that these cells can be dysregulated by overeating and lack of exercise. So that's why we sort of got interested in these muscle cells and um, we wanted to examine if there is a day-night rhythm in human energy metabolism and mitochondrial function in skeletal muscle. So for that, we have a very nice uh, equipment back here in Maastricht University. We have multiple um, metabolic chambers where we can confine uh, people. So we can lock them up in these metabolic chambers where we can perfectly monitor food intake, where we can perfectly monitor energy expenditure. We can compute substrate selection. We can uh, monitor and also induce physical activity in these chambers. So we have room for um, analysis here. It's a central room. This is what the room looks like from the inside. So it's just a small hotel room. And if you then confine the people in this room, as you can see, they're all happy, they're all smiles. So you can do that for a couple of days. We've done experiments up to, I think, seven days, um, but not in this particular case. In this case, we only confine the people for like uh, two days, 48 hours. And in this particular protocol, I'll first start showing data on a healthy, lean, um, and young uh, individuals that were confined in our metabolic chambers for like two days. So first we had a run-in day um, where they got used to the chambers, uh, they got some standardized meals. And then day two actually was the experimental day where we wanted to monitor 24 hour rhythmicity and metabolism just in a setting that was as normal as can be in a metabolic chamber. So no interventions whatsoever other than taking blood samples and muscle biopsies. And to obtain rhythmicity, uh, to monitor rhythmicity in the muscle, we obviously had to take quite a few muscle biopsies. So we took five muscle biopsies in 24 hours, um, just prior to the meals that were given. And one muscle biopsy was actually taken, um, well, I'm not saying during sleep, but at night when people were supposed to be sleeping, we needed to wake them up obviously for the muscle biopsy. We asked them to go and sleep again after the biopsy, but you can uh, imagine that during this period, the sleep was a bit of a disturbed. But at least we ended up by uh, having five muscle biopsies that were not biased by um, prior meals. And in these muscle biopsies, we started to look at mitochondrial capacity. And we did that using an uh, Ouroboros uh, based um, system where we can actually measure mitochondrial respiration in uh, permeabilized muscle fibers and compute state three respiration on a variety of substrates. And while doing so, uh, we came to the conclusion that in the muscle fibers of these young lean um, individuals, that there was a rhythmicity in mitochondrial respiration that was already there if you only um, 
provided to set the, the fibers um, uh, to substrates. And you actually saw that the rhythm became more profound when there were more substrates available. And that, that was a peak in mitochondrial respiration um, at 11 p.m. And this peak was not only present in state three respiration, it was also present um, in state two respiration, so uncoupled respiration. So typically, if you see changes in mitochondrial respiration, you'd like to know what happens to mitochondrial content. And because this was only 24 hours, we thought, okay, it's not so likely that the changes in respiratory capacity that we observe here are really due to changes in mitochondrial content, but we obviously need to measure. So that's what we did. We used quite an array of uh, measures of mitochondrial markers, but nothing really actually showed the uh, rhythmicity that we observed in mitochondrial function. So I think it's safe to say that, that the mitochondrial content over the 24 hour period was fairly stable. So then we thought, okay, um, what, what else can be involved in, 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 in this rhythmicity in mitochondrial respiration? So then there were these papers of, for example, Brian Clancy coming out showing data on mitochondrial networks. Uh, and we started imaging mitochondrial networks by staining, um, by using an antibody that stained all of the five mitochondrial complexes. And that's in blue displayed here, um, the mitochondrial network stained by this Oxfos antibody. And in green, you see a lipid droplet. So you can actually see already that within this muscle cell, there's an array of mitochondrial networks. So we know that there are dynamics in this mitochondrial network, that there's processes of uh, mitochondrial fragmentation and fusion fission going on. And although we do not exactly know in skeletal muscle um, what the reason is for this mechanism or what the functional consequences are, we know that it takes place. It's a regulated process. There's proteins involved there, amitofusins, DRP1s, OPA1. So we started, okay, um, in this particular model of 24-hour rhythmicity, let's start measuring these um, genes and these proteins that are involved in mitochondrial fusion fission. And upon doing so, um, results were not exactly consistent. Um, in some of the genes, there was a rhythm. In others, there was not. For the proteins, it was more or less flat. So we thought, okay, if the process is being regulated that fast, we may not need to look into the uh, genes or in the proteins themselves, but we actually need to monitor the network. Can we see and image the network? So um, we wanted to know whether the remodeling of the mitochondrial network can be explained by rhythmicity in respiratory capacity, or, or whether the remodeling was underlying the changes in respiratory capacity. So for that, I briefly need to run you through a little uh, method, uh, methodology. Um, first, we wanted to know what the timeline for these fusion fission events could be. Within a 24 hour period, um, would that suffice actually to have fusion fission of a mitochondrial network? So what we did is we took advantage of a mouse that has been created by other people. And it's a mouse that carries a, a UV um, sensitive dye. Uh, that actually shows the mitochondrial network. So if you um, UV uh, radiate this dye, it turns red. And um, the mitochondria that are uh, irradiated and that show up red, they will stay in this specific region that you uh, irradiated if there's no fusion going on. But if there's a fusion process going on, then the, the, the UV irradiated fibers, they will spread throughout, or the uh, UV irradiated mitochondria will spread throughout these muscle cells. So with these mice, we basically had a tool in hand to uh, look to the um, fusion fission um, processes, but we wanted to have it in a cell autonomous system. So from these mice, we isolated satellite cells, we cultured those, and with this culturing, we had the, um, the dendra uh, tag in the, in, the in the cells in culture. And if we then start irradiating the, um, the, the tag, you can see that directly there is a, a red spot um, uh, appearing. 
and that within a five minute period, you already see that fusion processes are going on and that the, um, the irradiated mitochondria start spreading within this particular cell. So within five minutes, we already observed that there's processes of fusion fission going on, or at least fusion. So we thought, okay, this gives us some tool in hand. This gives us the confidence that this process that we are monitoring in 24 hours, um, that that could actually be fusion of a mitochondrial network. So then we thought about tools to, to actually image the mitochondrial network in humans. And that's what this uh, cartoon shows you. Um, with this particular antibody against the uh, um, mitochondrial network, and in this case, I think we used the TOM20 antibody, so the translocase of the outer mitochondrial membrane to actually visualize the mitochondrial network. With the uh, super resolution microscopy, uh, we also looked into the contactness, the, the, the continuity of the network in these uh, human muscle sections. So this is based upon histology slides of the five muscle biopsies that we had in the, um, in the individuals in the rhythmicity experiment. So initially we thought, okay, we look at the images, we have experts uh, looking and saying whether the, the uh, network is connected or not. But we also started realizing if we want to do this more routinely, we need to go to a robust um, observer-free system. So we went from this more subjective analysis to a more uh, objective analysis where we made binary images of these files and had the computer uh, compute the different uh, distances between the individual pixels. And that gives us a marker for mitochondrial fragmentation that we are referring to as the mitochondrial fragmentation index. So the higher the mitochondrial fragmentation index, the more fragmented the mitochondrial network is. We're not actually as much interested in fragmentation of the network, but we were more interested into the intactness of the network. So for visual display, I will also use uh, one over the MFI. So one over the fragmentation index is an indicator of the fusion of the intactness of the network. So um, yeah, this is just a cartoon to show you that, that the subjective and objective scores uh, correlate nicely. Uh, and we had a better reliance on the, um, on the um, say the, the observer free quality of the computerized method than the um, observer method. So we did this uh, in a computerized measurement. And then we did this in all the uh, five biopsies of the individuals in the study. And we indeed observed that there was a rhythmicity in the mitochondrial fragmentation within type one muscle fibers, most fragmentation occurring at 6 p.m. and some uh, fragmentation going on at 11 p.m. Uh, sorry, uh, the least fragmentation going on at 6 p.m. and 11 p.m. In type two fibers, you see something similar. And if you then merge the fibers, this is the uh, profile of mitochondrial fragmentation that we observed in 24 hours. And then you might think, well, that does not really um, mimic or actually um, look like the pattern that we observed in respiration. Well, that's not entirely true, but if we compute the inverse of the fragmentation index, so the connectivity marker and use that as an overlay plot, we can see that there's quite some overlay between the normalized frag uh, fragmentation index and the normalized state three respiration. So what we do see here, and you actually see the same for the uh, state U respiration, we actually can conclude that there is a more elongated or a connected network that parallels this higher mitochondrial respiratory capacity. And then we wanted to look at the lipid droplets because the lipid droplets and the mitochondria, they interact tightly. Here you can see it at the super resolution image, mitochondria are stained green here. Lipid droplets are uh, stained blue. And you see that the, the lipid droplets, they are in tight interaction with quite, uh, quite some of these um, um, mitochondria. So we also in a pilot study observed that this is the image that we got at 11 p.m. With the, with the lipid droplets being stained in uh, green. And this is what you can see at 8 a.m. So there were way more uh, lipid droplets that were also larger. 
So we thought, okay, let's look, let's look, uh, and let's quantify lipid droplet size in these five um, biopsies over time. And we did that, and we again did that in the type one and in the type two fibers and merged it into all fibers. And indeed, we saw that there was a rhythmicity in lipid droplet size as well. And if you then try to make an overlap plot of the normalized mitochondrial fragmentation index and a normalized lipid droplet size, you actually do see that when the mitochondria are highly fragmented, uh, that's actually uh, when the respiration is highest, that lipid droplet size is uh, lowest. Sort of suggesting that the high mitochondrial respiratory capacity can be fueled um, by um, lipid droplets that are in vicinity of the mitochondria. So if we summarize that part, um, you can say, okay, mitochondrial respiration is rhythmic. This uh, rhythmicity is not due to changes in mitochondrial content or size. It is probably due to changes in mitochondrial network connectivity. And uh, the rhythmicity in mitochondrial respiration and mitochondrial network connectivity, they do coincide. We also observe that lipid droplet size is rhythmic and that this rhythmicity coincides with the rhythmicity in mitochondrial respiration and connectivity. So um, I thought that the MHAD was a, a acronym of the Muscle Health and Disease Day. It's not entirely true, I realized today, but I thought, okay, how about disease? This was the healthy situation. What about disease? So we did the very same study again, but now we did it in metabolically deprived, overweight individuals that were middle-aged. And here you will see uh, the subject characteristics. So indeed they're middle-aged, they have a fairly high BMI, and they have some aberrations in their glucose metabolism. If we then look through mitochondrial respiration, you almost see that at state three MOG, at state three MOGS, and at state U, um, the mitochondrial respiration is not rhythmic. And just to uh, remind you, these are the data that we had from the young, lean, uh, healthy individuals. So first and for all, their respiratory level is way higher. And we do see the rhythmicity here that is apparently absent in these elder metabolically compromised individuals. So clearly we wanted to know uh, whether this case, um, um, the mitochondrial respiration, um, so we can conclude that the mitochondrial respiration is lost in the elderly. Um, and we wanted to know whether the mitochondrial network remodeling was also lost. And in this case, we thought, okay, we need to do a little more with the, um, with the histology that we have. So we developed a method where we can actually um, quantify not only the mitochondrial network, but we can also quantify uh, the lipid droplet mitochondrial contact size. So here you see an example here in white, uh, you do see the mitochondrial network. In uh, green, you see the lipid droplets. And then by peeling off, um, software medically, so to say, peeling off the, the mitochondrial network, we display the contact sites here in blue. So here we see the mitochondria again, here we see a lipid droplet, and in pseudo colored blue, we do see mitochondrial contact sites that you can see here as well. And we can now quantify the network integrity, mitochondrial size, uh, sorry, lipid droplet size, and a lipid droplet mitochondrial interaction. And uh, with this tool, we started to quantify uh, the mitochondrial network. But there, um, in this case, I must admit that the corona COVID situation killed us a little. And uh, we do not yet have all the data from the um, type 2 diabetics. So there's a bit of a cliffhanger here. But if you invite me next year, David, I'd be happy to share the data from the type 2 diabetics on the mitochondrial networks and the lipid droplets. Or hopefully we have it published by then already. Um, so that's, um, I think, a bit of a cliffhanger and maybe a bit of a disappointment that we don't have it finished yet. At least I was very eager to have the data, but we did not simply make it for today. Um, and this is actually the entire group that did the work. Uh, there's lots of people, these human studies, as you can imagine, uh, you really need a lot of people to do this. Um, also, the microscopy really needs uh, a lot of work, so a lot of people. And I must admit, it was the group BC, so before Corona. Uh, unfortunately, Corona reduced uh, the group size a little, not because people died or passed away, 
but simply because we could not uh, afford paying them all. And with that, I'd like to end uh, the story and give the floor back to David. Well, thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, that's great. I love that morphology and uh, um, that it does really require a lot of people to do that kind of uh, technique, that kind of very, very uh, careful microscopy. So um, let me see, I have, a, I have a question from the Q&A and also one of my own. I, uh, you were very careful in uh, correlating the, uh, the network with the respiration and I really appreciated that. that uh, uh, but I noticed that the respiration varies about probably, I don't know, 10, 15% over the course of a day. Do you feel that that is, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. I just wonder if it's, do you think it's physiologically important? Ah, um, we actually, it's a very good question because we, we actually were uh, very uh, excited by the magnitude of change or the magnitude of, of the difference between the, the peak and the trough, so to say. Because as you were saying, it's almost like a 20% difference. And if we, we've done, for example, a 12 week training program in individuals with type two diabetes, uh, and we observed only like an 18 to 20% increase in mitochondrial capacity in the, in the myofibers. So that order of difference, order of increase in the mitochondrial respiratory capacity was in the same order of magnitude as we observed here for the 24 hour rhythmicity. So we do think it's a physiologically relevant uh, difference. We were struck by the, by the order of magnitude and, and it may also help us to explain a little um, why there's still so much of a debate whether or not mitochondrial function is down in metabolically compromised individuals. Mm -hmm. Because this shows you that if you change the timing of the biopsy in the day, you can already miss the difference that might be there. Yeah. So yeah. To some extent, we're making things and also life way uh, too complicated for ourselves with this study. But yeah, that's the way it is. <laughs> uh, Chris Perry is asking, did you try comparing pyruvate oxidation to fat oxidation when you did the respirometry? Would that, uh, um, could the circadian rhythms change with different substrate selection? Yeah. Very good question. Uh, unfortunately, in our hands, uh, the pyruvate or the um, fat oxidation, if we apply these substrates to the permeabilized fibers, it doesn't work that well. It works very nice in isolated mitochondria. It doesn't really work too well in the, um, in the fibers. So we played around a little with octanol, carnitine, these kind of things. Um, and we did a little pyruvate, but, but at some stage we decided, okay, if we do muscle fibers, we always go for malate, glutamate, succinate, um, and run these traces. And we've run these traces consistently through all our human studies in the fibers. So we simply do not have octanol carnitine data for these fibers. Um, so actually, uh, the short answer is no, we do not know. Um, yeah, but it's, it's a good question. But if we go to isolate the mitochondria, obviously you will not observe these kind of things because they are probably not in the network anymore. Right, because right, of all right. the, yeah. Right, right, yeah. right. Final question, Dr. Mireille Kacho asks, uh, was there any change in maximum respiratory capacity over the course of the day? Yeah, so the maximal respiratory capacity we measured as a state uncoupled respiration. So that is... Um, yeah. Upon uh, state three, we applied FCCP, we titrated that to a max. So that actually is the maximal respiratory capacity. So, so um, state U or state uncoupled gives the same results as this state three. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Okay, good, very good. I invite others to ask questions through the chat to, to Dr. Hesselink. We're gonna have to move on. Thank you very much for a very good talk. Thank you, uh, Matisse. Great. You're